Some of them will turn to page 26 of the first Solomon evening. Some of 26. Brother uh, Kirk gave them the Solomon service. Brother uh, Lord called the open prayer and Brother Michael Long closed the prayer. Uh, didn't have any updates on the prayer list. Uh, also, she uh, was with Mother Ramona, uh, especially in her prayers this week, and she has a kidney removed Thursday. Uh, very serious uh, surgery for any woman, but uh, keep her in thoughts and prayers too, especially. As far as the men's business meeting, we will have it next Sunday, Lord willing. And uh, March 22nd, we'll have just the service time for fellowship meal. And March 29th, we'll be our fifth Sunday worship for the Meadows. One of the announcements that I wasn't going to make after the business meeting was that we did sell the house um, during the uh, Discussions about it and contract negotiations and everything. It was required that we submit a letter of intent. Uh, I backed up to the business meeting in January where we discussed it. Uh, and then he asked me if I'd announced it for the pulpit and all of them reviewed it. Um, I don't know if I did that or not, but uh, as of now, it has officially been sold uh, February 25th and closed on it. So, more details on that. If anybody needs some, just let me know. Um, but we did sell the house. Neutralization verse this week is Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Thank you for being here. Number 26, the open song. 26, thank you, Matthew. Oh, man, 
I want to welcome you back. It's good to see you. Appreciate so much your efforts to make it here and be a part of the worship that we're carrying on here at this time and place. I trust that God will bless us for the energy and the effort we make to honor Him as the only true living God. I'm thankful that you're here and we have this opportunity. We've been studying from the Old Testament and we are in the process of studying from the book of Joel tonight. Closing in on the end of our study, I was thinking maybe that we might go into the Old Testament prophets and look at them for a few minutes maybe after this. Not made up my mind yet, but that's something of a possibility. I uh, just wanted to make mention to those of you who go out to the side door here. Uh, we have had a, or are in the process of getting some uh, closers for those doors. They should be on by Wednesday night, but uh, after you entered into the building, uh, I went behind you and locked that door so that we would be banging back and forth in the wind. But, uh, so uh, you're locked in the ark and you can't get out until somebody lets you out. So you go through another door. We're getting that repaired, so uh, we should have that fixed by Wednesday night. Uh, Joel, the discussion of Joel as we go through that. First, we're going to look at the aspects of some interesting information. Uh, the, book, the book contains three chapters, 73 verses, and 2,033 words of the King James Version. Time frame for the book of Joel was uh, between 835 B.C. and 750 B.C. So we backed up just a little from the time frame in which uh, both uh, Israel and Judah were carried off into captivity. We're looking at the uh, unfaithfulness of the Israel nation, both Judah and Israel, in relationship to their gods at that particular time. The uh, book, uh, the name Joel means Jehovah is God. Joel's father was the fool, and that's the only background information that we have on the prophet of Joel. It is believed, uh, I read <coughs> most of the that I read about it, that it was believed that Joel was probably a uh, priest because of uh, the fact that he knew so much about uh, the, the uh, temple and worship. Uh, not for, uh, for sure about that, but he gives no more information as far as the tribe that he was from. But if he was a priest, he would probably have been from the Levitical tribe. The book begins with a, uh, a declaration of great gloom uh, for the children of Israel, a not a very uh, good outlook for them, but it ends with a brighter picture and a more uh, exciting uh, future uh, that is described by Joel in his prophecy. Joel, the authorship, is uh, explicitly, without denying it, uh, Joel himself, the word of the Lord, came to Joel, the son of Bethuel, uh, Joel 1 and verse 1. So there's not much debate about the authorship of the book. Uh, inspiration in the book of Joel. In the Old Testament, we have, if you look here, Old Testament relationships. This is some of the different Old Testament uh books of prophecy, which either mention Joel or Joel mentions them. You see there Isaiah, Zephaniah, Obadiah, Amos, Micah, and Ezekiel are all cross-referenced with the book of Joel. So we, uh, there's no uh, debate or not any much debate about the inspiration of the book and the standing of it being uh, from God himself. References in the New Testament, the most uh, important one or the most well-known one is that of Acts chapter 2 where Peter, upon preaching the first gospel sermon, referred to the book of Joel. But people who uh, had come into the temple at the coming of the Holy Spirit there in Acts chapter 2 had accused those people who were up speaking in tongues who have been, have been drunk. But Peter steps up and he says, these men are not drunk, but this is the prophecy of which Joel spoke of in Joel chapter 2. And there in Acts chapter 2 he says, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, said God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will shoot wonders in heaven above, and signs of the earth beneath, and blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. Come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter 
Peter refers to this particular part of the prophecy of Joel in his preaching to those people on the commandments of what God expected them to do in order to be saved. Joel had a hand in saying that Jesus Christ would come on the scene, that his kingdom would be established, and that God would call all people who were to be saved into the restored kingdom of Israel. Now we know from our study of the Old Testament, as far as we've gone there, that there was a no restoration of the Old Testament Israel. The northern kingdom was destroyed, carried away into Syrian captivity, never to be restored again. But if you look, as we look at the, the prophecy of Joel, it will see we'll see in it that Joel makes mention that both Israel and Judah would be restored. Speaking of the fact that there would be a remnant of Jews who would be called into the church of Christ or in the kingdom of a God in the New Testament. But this is what that is a, a inspired word is leading to or telling us somewhat about. And if we go and we look at the accounts in Acts chapter, in, in several accounts in Acts, uh, we see some of the things that are described here recorded in the New Testament. Uh, the, the sun being darkened, that could be uh, are shown when Jesus was hanging upon the cross. For three hours, there, there was complete darkness and the sun didn't shine at, in the middle of the day. If you look at Acts chapter 11, Agabus prophesied. If you look at Acts chapter 21, verse 9, Philip had four daughters who prophesied. So we see some of the fulfillments of that. We cannot completely understand or describe everything that Joel is talking about, but we do and can believe that it's true because here Peter, by inspiration, says these are the things that were going to take place with the coming of Christ, with the Messiah, and with the coming of the kingdom and the restoration or the calling of people into that kingdom for salvation. But that is the most important reference that we have in the New Testament of the book of Joel. Purposes for the book of Joel, to expose Israel's, and when I say the word Israel there, I'm talking about both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, uh, devastation due to their unfaithfulness. Secondly, it was a call to repentance. As we've looked at most of the prophets in the Old Testament, their declaration was to the fact that the people of God needed to come to repentance. That is always a story surrounding God's people. We all make mistakes. We all sin in our lives, and we should be willing and able to confess those things that are wrong in our lives, repent of them, and make the changes necessary in our lives so that we can be in a right relationship with God. That is the job of God's prophets throughout all of time. That's the job of God's preachers today. And unfortunately, many preachers today don't fall into that category. They want to tell us more along the lines of, you're okay and I'm okay. And, uh, you know, God's going to bless us and we're going to be okay as long as we uh, keep going like we're going. And that's not always the case. There are many times where we need to look into ourselves, into our lives, and see where we need to make changes to be right with God. And then the third thing and the purposes of the book of Joel is that is to forecast the uh, forecast the Israel Israel's future glory. There shouldn't be a V in there, but there is. Forecast Israel's future glory. And we explained that just a little bit a minute ago, talking about Israel's future glory is our future glory as well, or our calling into the church. And God was not, through Joel describing all there, there would be a remnant to come back into the land of Canaan and to restore the southern kingdom. That was not the complete fulfillment of that prophecy, but the prophecy of the coming of the spiritual kingdom, the church of Jesus Christ. An outline of the book of uh, Joel would be uh, somewhat in this manner. The devastation of the land of Judah described from the number two. God's call of repentance from the number three. The blessings that are promised to Israel. And then the judgment that is pronounced upon the nations that surround uh, the children of Israel. And then the final one is the spiritual uh, glory that is to be described uh, in the restoration of Israel, uh, both as a nation uh, in the call back to Judah, and as well in the calling of people to God by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The letter that we want to use to describe the book of Joel tonight is the letter L. L. The first L in that particular discussion is going to be that of locusts. There is a curse that is discussed by the book of Joel in detail, especially in chapter number 1, uh, if you want to turn and look at Joel chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and 
and that which the canker worm has left, the caterpillar has to do. Now I looked at uh, those barns, and I looked at uh, uh, well uh, another, and I can't remember which one it was. Uh, book as far as some of the things that are said about this, and both of the ones that I looked at said that in this particular verse, it's not describing different stages of the locust, but it's talking about different varieties of locusts. And the way that it was laid out is that one wave would come of these locusts that would destroy part of the land, and God would call upon the children of Israel to repent at that point, and there would be no repentance, and then another wave of these locusts would come on so these things, the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, all descriptions of the same thing, just different varieties of this thing coming upon because of the wickedness of the children of Israel. And so it's going to be very harsh. And if you would, look at, at, uh, at uh, Joel uh, chapter 1. And I want to look for just a minute and read even a little bit more detail of what was being described as the harshness of what was happening to these people because of their wickedness. First, I want us to look at, uh, or consider that, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse number 38 before we do that reading. If we were to go back and to look at that particular passage of Scripture, this is the time frame that the children of Israel are in the wilderness and they're making preparation to go into the promised land. And Moses takes the children of Israel and he goes up on the Mount Ebal and he builds an altar there. And he has some of the children of Israel on the left-hand side, and he has some of the children of Israel on the right-hand side, and he pronounces upon them a blessing and a curse. He says that if you follow the commandments of God, these things are going to happen to you, and it's going to be good. God will bless you eminently, and things will go well with you. But if you don't live faithfully unto me, and you disobey uh, the commandments that I give you, and you follow after the people that you are taking their land from, then these curses will come upon you. And one of the specific curses that is mentioned by Moses there before they cross the Jordan River is found in verse 38. It says, Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shalt gather but little, for the locusts shall consume it. This is hundreds of years before the children of Israel at this particular time. And God proved Moses and his prophets and said, If you fail to live up to the commandments that I give you, you're going to be cursed. And this is exactly what happened to these. And I want us to look for just a minute at some of the other things. If you have your Bibles, look at the beginning at verse number 5. It goes on and gives further details of the things that would happen or that were happening to the children of Israel because of their unfaithfulness to God. It says, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and have the cheek of a great line. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree, and he hath made it clean bare, and cast away the branches thereof, and are made white. Let lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of reunion. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest and the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted, the land mourneth, for the corn is wasted, and the new wine is dried up, and the oil languished. Be ashamed, be ye ashamed, O ye husbands, of how, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languished, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the ash tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because the joy is withered away from the sons of men. Joel here describes the desolation that is going to come upon the land. And it describes it as an army coming upon the children of Israel to lay desolate the land. But the thing that he's describing here, and many of the, the uh, people who uh, look back at this book think that it was an allegory describing the different kingdoms that were to come and overrun and, and capture the land of Jerusalem, Judea, and Israel. But we see here the description as it would be that of the locusts that come upon the land and how they lay the waste and how the children of Israel in it were in dire straits and desperate situations because of this situation that they had brought upon themselves in wickedness. My point to this is all that when God says that if you fail to live up to what you're supposed to and obey my commandments and live like you're supposed to, then you're going to be cursed. 
And as surely as Moses described what was going to happen to these people long before they were established in the kingdom, you know, they came across the Jordan River and they were established and they had judges for a long time before they even had kings and before the kingdom was divided. But even after all that, what Moses said those hundreds of years ago exactly happened like he had prophesied it would. When God says, if you don't live faithfully to me, you're going to be cursed. We need to take it to heart because God has given us an example, a strong example of exactly how hard our lives can be when we're unfaithful to Him. The second L of the book of Joel is that of lament. Lament. If you have your Bibles, you might want to look at Joel chapter 1 and verse number 13. It says, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. How, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meal offering and for the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify yourself, verse number 14. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land in the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. God calls on these people to repent. I use the word lament here. Uh, a, an emotion of sadness or sorrow that God calls upon these people to express towards God because of the circumstances that they're in. And we describe the circumstances in the first one with the locusts. But God is not calling upon them to lament the fact that they're in a desperate situation because of the land and because of the locusts, but he's calling on them to <coughs> lament, to be sorrowful because of their heart, their lives that they were living you know, many times people get sad and uh, despondent because of the circumstances that surround their life. They lose a job. Someone passes away. A good friend turns their back on them. These things are disheartening to people. But God wants us to look deeper into our lives and be sad, be sorrowful because of the sin that is surrounding us. In the lives of those that we love and care about, those that we know about, in the land that we live in. And especially in our own lives. God wants us to be sorrowful. God describes sorrow as a blessing to mankind on many occasions in the Bible. We should be a sorrowful person and God will bless us. When we're sorrowful, God will lift us up. But we must lament. We must be sorrowful for the things that are wrong in our own lives before God will reach down and provide for us those things will bring joy to our lives. Joel 2 and verse 12 goes on to describe it even more when he says, Therefore also now, said the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with, all, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart, not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, and slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. God doesn't want us to go buy us a new suit or a new dress set of clothes to come before God to show that we've made a change in our lives. The Israelites were very good at rending their clothes, showing their sorrow for the things that were going on. They were easily brought to sorrow or the expressive sorrow of sackcloth and ashes. We read that quite often in the Old Testament as an expression of the Jews in showing their sorrow for what was going on in their lives. But that's not what God was calling for. He wasn't calling for an outward expression, expression of sorrow. And he's not calling for that from us today. He wants to be truly uh, brought to sorrow in our hearts, godly sorrow, things that will change us, make us a different person before God, and cause us to live a different kind of life. The third L in the book of Joel is that of leverage. We know what it is to take a, a lever and to move things with it, being able to use something because even in our weakness to be able to do something that's much above what we would be able to do in, in by ourselves. And that's what we're talking about here by submitting ourselves to God, and humbling ourselves to God, and becoming uh, sorrowful for the things that are God. It provides us a leverage in our lives that is beyond anything that we can do in of ourselves. In Joel chapter 2 and verse 21, God said... Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. When we submit ourselves to God in the way that God tells us to submit ourselves, we can expect great blessings in our lives. God will bless us by uh, 
uh, beyond the means of what we should ever expect when we turn our lives around. It's not uh, even in the sense of God, if we do this, God will bless us in an equal manner. Uh, but it's, if we do this, God will abundantly bless us even more. And so we want to consider that. I want to look at Joel 2 and verses 22 through 27 as an expression of God as to how much more uh, God will bless us when we do turn our lives towards him. It says, Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust had eaten, and the cackworm, and the caterpillar, and the palm worm, my great army which I sent among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Praise the name of your, the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. God said, if you will turn your hearts over to me, if you will turn your back on the ways of the world, then I will bless you, and I will replace and replenish all that you have. <laughs> Just thinking about the account of Job and all that he lost, although it was not because of his wickedness that he lost that, but when God said, decided that he was going to restore to Job all that had been taken from him, it says that he restored it uh, more than he had lost. And that's the truth of God towards all of those who will be faithful to him and turn their lives back over to him. And the last deal that we want to think about when we think about the book of Joel is that of lead. Lead in the sense that God is leading us to repentance. In Joel 3 and chapter 1 it says, For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among all the nations and parted from my land. God said at some point, at some time, in some form or some fashion, he would call those children of Israel back together. He would lead them back to that. And we know that under Cyrus the king, that it was made possible for the children of Israel to go back to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, and to rebuild the walls, and to reestablish the nation of Israel. God promised that by prophecy to them. He led to uh, the fulfillment of that using a man who was not even a child of God, but someone who was a heathen king. God will lead us back if we will but follow him. It's interesting to note in Joel 2, 3, and verse 2, it says, And bring them into the valley of Jehoshaphat. The commentaries say that there is no such place as the Valley of Jehoshaphat in the land of King. It's not a specific place, but it's an allusion to or a symbolic uh, story of an account found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, I believe it is. And there, the children of Judah were under besiege by their enemies. Ammon and Moab and the people of the mountain of Seir had gathered all together and determined that they were going to attack Judah and Jerusalem and overrun them and take them over. It, the enemy was vastly outnumbered the children of Israel. They knew that by themselves there was no way that they could be able to overcome what was getting ready to happen to them if God did not step in. And Jehoshaphat there on that particular occasion called for a great fast and mourning and went to prayer to God to save them from that particular situation. And on that account in 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles 20, God stepped in. He sent by a uh, uh, word to Joseph at, that he would take care of the situation. He said specifically, the battle is not yours, but the battle is mine, and I will be victorious. And so God came down upon that situation and calls those people, first of all, the people of Ammon and the people of Moab, turned on the people from the Mount of Sea and completely destroyed them. And after they had destroyed that army, they turned on each other and destroyed each other. And so when it when Judah showed up at the battle, they saw in the field all the great armies of those people who were their enemies dead in the field. And so they went back and just took the, the prophets from all those people who had died 
for their own. God had handled that situation for them as he promised he would do. And it's an illustration or symbol for us that God will take care of his own. That we don't have to worry about what the numbers are or what the odds are against us. So what can we learn from the book of Joel? What is the appeal of Joel? The first thing that we want to consider is what is found in Joel chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Joel, in his prophecy, called upon the children of Israel to make a decision. They had to decide which way they were going to go. Were they going to go back to God and follow God, or were they going to continue down the path that would lead them to ultimate destruction? <coughs> the same is true for you and I today. We're in a situation where we must make the decision whether or not we're going to follow Christ or live in our own righteousness. Whether we're going to trust God or trust the things that we have in this life to hold us up. Are we going to obey God or are we going to live for ourselves? We live in a point in the valley of decision just like they did say. But also, much is mentioned about the day of the Lord in the book of Joel. And we need to be aware that there is a day known as the day of the Lord. The Bible describes the day of the Lord in many different ways. One way it describes it is the day of the Lord is the day of judgment that God will bring upon all those nations round about, the enemies of God's people. We see it happen. We see it happen in the account that we just talked about in, in the story of Jehoshaphat. But God has always said that he will bring judgment on all people. Also, it talks about the day of judgment being the day when God will call, when the Lord shall return, and we shall uh, have to answer for our lives. And, and in Romans 2 and verse 16, in that day, God will call upon us to stand in judgment before the Lord. The question that I have for you and I tonight is, are we, as in the valley of decision, ready to make the right decision towards God? We have to answer for what we do in this life, whether we're obedient to God. If we're not a child of God, we will answer for that. If we are a child of God, we will answer not living faithful to God. So as you stand in that valley, facing the Lord's day, the day of the Lord, what will your answer be? Will you come to the Lord in obedience if you need to? I hope that you will. While together we stand. Why do you wait, dear brother? Why do you never be so long? You say you Oh, great sinners, ain't it thy call? Why not? Why not? Why not? Don't you give up? Why not?
Lord, some of us been left prepared for this morning. Like now, we pray in your name. Amen. 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 Father, we ask you please to be the out of taking the bread and undertaking it. This matter, in Christ's name. We ask you now to bless this cup, the curse of your son's blood. Be the one who takes it and they do so, no matter if it's in your sight, in Christ's name. Today, we meet again this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Our final song for tonight's service will be 829. 829. We'd like to stand as we sing this song tonight. <laughs> Sing the first and last verse. I'm satisfied with just talking about a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the rest will shine, I want a gold one and silver in my Thank you. 